I want to focus tonight on Jesus as co-creator. And this is a obviously familiar idea for Christians. And I think the longer we're Christians, we sort of take this for granted. But I want you to ask yourself tonight this question that you see on the slide behind me. Essentially, where in the world do the New Testament writers get this idea? Now, I think the easy, and I don't want to call it a cop-out because there's a certain level of legitimacy to it, you could say, well, they got that because they were inspired to write what they wrote and God just gave them that information and that's the answer. Well, I'm, I'm obviously not going to rule that out. But what I wanted to get you to consider and realize is that the idea of God having a co-creator is not new to Christianity. Okay? It, it comes from the Old Testament. And I personally, as a, as a scholar and as someone who has taught many undergrad classes, and I, I get to interact with a lot of people whose, I think, predominantly their questions are sincere, but sometimes you get uh, people who just enjoy uh, picking on Christianity and agitating. And one of the things that they like to harp on is, is this notion that Christianity, the, the writers of the New Testament, just basically sort of made things up. Um, or that they're dependent in some way on pagan literature, uh, pagan religious literature from the ancient Mediterranean for their ideas. Uh, if you've been exposed to the Da Vinci Code at all, uh, you know that to be the case. And I, in fact, I'm going to bring up the Da Vinci Code tonight once or twice because what we're going to cover, some parts of what we're going to cover, have been used in pop culture, and that's probably the best example, in uh, what I would call heretical ways and also very antagonistic ways. But I want you to be a little sensitive to the, to the fact that you really, there's an importance attached to being able to show that the New Testament and the Old Testament are not these things that you can drive a wedge between, that there's continuity of thought between the two. And that would be reasonable since we believe that there's the same divine author. And this is a good, a good example because you read certain statements in the New Testament that are pretty clear that have Jesus as the co-creator. Here's one in Colossians, perhaps the most familiar, Colossians chapter 1. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness, God specifically, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. So there's a reference to Jesus. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the, in, the image of the invisible God, again still speaking of Jesus, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created. Pretty clear statement in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, those are all terms for divine beings, what we would think of as angelic beings. So it covers a lot of ground. Everything in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, Jesus is given credit for at least uh, being participating in the creation. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, in verse 17. You get the same idea in 1 Corinthians 8. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist. So God gets the credit in that part of the verse. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. This is actually a little more precise in terms of the idea, because you... When you talk about giving Jesus credit for creation, and of course God gets credit for creation, and we think of God as the creator from the Old Testament, the language in the New Testament sometimes, as in this verse, distinguishes between sort of God as an ultimate creator and Jesus as the agent of creation, the means by which everything was brought into existence. We'll be talking about that language as well. Now, let's go here to... I actually want to skip ahead here. Let's go to Genesis 1, 1 to 3. If you look at this verse, very familiar, actually three verses, what's the answer to the question? What is God's agent or means of creation? Because when you think of creation, this is the passage you think of, right? Genesis 1. So what would you say is the answer? Okay, I hear the word coming from verse 3. 
And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So the word, word, isn't actually in the passage, but God is speaking. So there you have this association with God, who is a spirit. The Old Testament tells us God does not have a body. The New Testament tells us God does not have a body. God doesn't have vocal cords that that can vibrate and make sound. Okay, so this language is anthropomorphic. And it suggests that God is doing something, and the result of of his activity, the result of his speaking, in some way brings about everything that, that, it, that, that, that there is. Now, we know from the New Testament, you know, we have John chapter 1 in the beginning, you know, was the Word, and the Word was God, the Word was with God, and all that. So we know that there's a, there's a conceptual connection between what's going on. But I want to show you that the idea, and we hit a, f- a few of these last week, and for the sake of those who weren't here, I'm going to go quickly through these. The idea of the word as an embodied entity, an embodied person, in human form, on occasion the, the, the description gets to that level. That idea is very familiar to the, to the Old Testament. And I mentioned last week, and I'll say it again this week, that I think that is what John is drawing on in chapter 1 of his, his gospel. Here we have Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, in something visual. Fear not, Abram, I'm your shield. Your reward shall be very great. It goes down a few verses. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. He comes back. And he says to Abram, This man shall not be your heir, referring to Eliezer of Damascus. Your, own, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him, in other words, he, the word, brought him, Abram, outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he, the word, said to Abram, So shall your offspring be. And Abram's response is, according to the biblical writer, and he believed Yahweh. Okay, that, that's who's talking to him. So again, you get this mixing of the divine name Yahweh with the word, And the narrative reads as though Abraham is seeing another individual who takes him outside and talks to him. Okay, if the writer wanted to make it clear that Abraham wasn't seeing anything, that he has this thing in his ear, maybe like this, he has this this thing, this sound or something, sensation in his ear, in his head, he could have made it a lot clearer than this, because this is the language again a visual appearance and embodiment and, and as though another person's there. First Samuel 3 we talked about. The young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. And the word of the Lord, there's the phrase again, was rare in those days. There was no frequent what? Vision. Okay? Again, something you see. So there's a connection between a thing seen and the word of the Lord. The Lord came and stood, calling us at other times. So you know, the, you know the story. I'm not going to rehearse too much of it, but Samuel hears this voice several times. Eli says, hey, if it happens again, you say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And here in verse 10, the Lord came and stood. And if you're, a dis- if you're just a spirit, it's kind of an odd word to use of you if you don't have some sort of person, personality or some sort of uh, maybe ne- not necessarily substance. Although there are embodied passages where there's a tactile thing going on. We're going to see one in a moment. But there's at least another, another person there in the room that's visual. And this, it's Yahweh. The Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. Now the key here is the phrase, at other times. Because in the very first verse, the writer says, hey, the word of the Lord was rare in those days, but I'm going to tell you about a story. I'm going to tell you something that happened to Samuel. And he connects that back to this word of the Lord being rare. And when you get to the end of the passage, he ties it together there, too. So the beginning of, the, beginning of chapter 3, the word of the Lord's rare. At the end of the chapter, we read this. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. Yahweh was with him. And let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord, a prophet of Yahweh. And Yahweh appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord, Yahweh himself, revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word 
of the Lord. So again, it's, it's all connected to a visual presence, something Samuel can see. And, and that thing, that, that person that Samuel's seeing is called the Word. Jeremiah 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah. This is how the prophecy of Jeremiah begins. Verse 4, the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah is the speaker now, saying, go down to verse 6, Jeremiah says, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, it's Adonai, it's Yahweh Elohim, Adonai Elohim. So Jeremiah is referring to this word who came to him as Yahweh. Yahweh Elohim, Adonai Elohim. Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak. You know, he gets his commissions like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Verse 9, then Yahweh put out his hand and touched my mouth. Again, it's a corporeal, physicalized, embodied presence. And that physicalized person is the word. Okay, so there's a, there's a lot of Old Testament antecedent to this. In fact, if you're interested in uh, this kind of thinking among Jews, I would advise you to do a little work in the Targums. Now, the Targums are Aramaic translations of both Old and New Testament, and for our purposes, we're interested in the Old. There are a number of passages in the Old Testament where you can't really tell. There's somebody else with Yahweh, <clears throat> and it might be the angel, but it might be just somebody else, or that God refers to himself in the third person, which is kind of odd. And whoever put the Targums together, the translations, used the Aramaic word memra. That's the word, Aramaic word for word. It shows up in all sorts of passages that you won't find in the Old Testament. It's interpretive. And so here you have Jews. And all you got to do is Google the word memra, M-E-M-R-A. And it's going to be fascinating for you because here you have Jews looking at their own Hebrew Bible and seeing Yahweh and then this Memra guy in different passages. Again, they're, they have this sort of consciousness because they, they, they're very in tune with their text. And they have a sense that there's Yahweh invisible and there's this other Yahweh out there. And sometimes they're in the same passage at the same time. And so that, that's part of their, their theological con consciousness. Of course, going back to the New Testament, John picks up on this idea, and he has the Word as the agent of creation. The first three verses of John. And if you go down about around verse 14, we have the Word made flesh. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Again, very clear reference to Jesus. And so this is one means, and probably the one most familiar to you, even though if... If you were not familiar with all those Old Testament passages, the ideas, I think, were familiar. To, to where the New Testament writers would get this, but there's actually another one that is probably less familiar and which might be kind of surprising. Now, let's go to the second creation passage. Not the only, there are more than two creation passages in the Old Testament, but this is the one for our purposes that we want to focus on. Who is the agent or what is the agent of creation here? Proverbs 8, 22. Anybody know what the, the passage is about? Okay, wisdom. If you go back to Proverbs 1, read up through chapter 8, you're going to see the, a character known as wisdom. And the character is spoken of in female terms. In other words, there, are, there will be pronouns that refer back to wisdom like her and she. And then you get to chapter 8, and wisdom is speaking at the beginning of the chapter, and you get down to verse 22, and we read, Yahweh the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago I was set up, at the first, before the beginnings of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. Again, this is, this is language drawn from Genesis. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. 
before he had made the earth with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world. Now I have possessed in blue, and at the bottom you've already noticed, the word translated possessed here in the NIV is translated brought forth, NRSV has created, and the NLT has formed. We're going to come back to the, the terminological difficulty there, but you continue on with Proverbs 8, look at what wisdom says. When he, God, established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, again, this is all Genesis language, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. Okay, wisdom is cast as a co-creator in the Old Testament. And wisdom is also cast as a female. Now I want you to keep that in the back of your mind, and I'm going to, I'll probably hold discussion on, well, why female? I, I'll, I'll mention something now, and if you want to talk about it later, we can, during Q&A. The reason for the feminine, in reality, is that the word wisdom, chokmah, in Hebrew, is feminine. Okay, it's grammatically feminine. If you've ever studied a foreign language, you know that nouns, especially, have gender. It's a means of classification so that nouns and adjectives and verbs and subjects can be matched up in grammatical agreement. It really has nothing to do with biology. Sometimes it can, for instance, you know, a young man, you know, na'ar, okay, that's going to be masculine. Na'ara, young maiden, young girl, okay, that's feminine, all right? Sometimes there's a congruence. Greek, though, I'll give you an example of where these, these don't have congruence. Greek, the word technon, little child, is neuter. German, mädchen, little girl, is neuter. Okay. Don't look for a biological rhyme or reason to the way languages work. But because chokmah is feminine, that's why the translators will reflect feminine terminology. Plus, wisdom in Proverbs is set over against lady folly. You know, you, you'll hear commentators talk about lady wisdom. And she is set, in her ways are set over against the salacious, um, you know, whorish woman in Proverbs that you're warned to stay away from. So there's this opposition. And so to, do, to pull that off in literary terms, you have to cast both of them as females. Now keep that in the back of your mind. We see that wisdom was the agent, but who or what was wisdom? In the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, which we so cleverly call the intertestamental period, <laughs> the, more, the, the better term is second temple period because of what happens at the end of the Old Testament. They rebuild the temple, and then that one lasts until the first century. But in the intertestamental period, there is a, a very large body of literature that's written by Jewish rabbis and scholars and thinkers, religious authorities, in all stripes. And they know their Old Testament. And they comment and produce a lot of material that deals with wisdom. Now, what I want you to, to track with me here is that I'm, we've looked at what the Old Testament does. There's this character, Wisdom, out there that's co-creator. Now we're going to look at what... Jewish thinkers, before we get to the era of Jesus and the New Testament, thought about that. And then we'll go back to the New Testament. And you'll find, again, a, a correlation uh, that the New Testament writers are tracking all this, but they do some important things that translate to theological differences with mainstream Judaism. And when you hear what those are, I think they're going to be kind of striking to you. It'll put the context of Paul's preaching, especially, in a new light. One of the books that was produced during this period is The Wisdom of Solomon. Um, it's, it's typical wisdom literature. Uh, it goes off into some theological tangents, just like we saw Proverbs do. 
But the writer here, again, these are all Jewish writers. I will tell you what wisdom is and how she, there's the feminine language, came to be. And I will hide no secrets from you, but I will trace her course from the beginning of creation and make knowledge of her clear. I will not pass by the truth. Another chapter, the same writer, same book, says, For wisdom, the fashioner of all things, again, he's getting that from Proverbs, taught me. For she is a breath of the power of God and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, nothing defiled gains entrance into her. For she is a reflection, and I have a Greek word there that we're going to pick up in a few minutes, apogasma. She is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God, and an image of his goodness. Chapter 9. O God of my ancestors and Lord of, my, Lord of mercy, who have made all things by your word. Isn't that interesting? You made all things by your word. Then he's going to talk about wisdom. And by your wisdom have formed humankind to have dominion over the creatures you have made and rule the world in holiness and righteousness and pronounce judgment in uprightness of soul. Give me the wisdom that sits by your throne. That's an odd phrase. Wisdom that sits by your throne. That implies that there's another throne. I uh, kind of wonder if that's the right hand of God. Okay. Do not reject me from among your servants. With you is wisdom. With you, speaking to God again. She who knows your works and was present when you made the world. She understands what is pleasing in your sight and what is right according to your commandments. Send her forth from the holy heavens and from the throne of your glory send her. There she is at the throne. That's where like, she's get, getting her assignment. So she's sent by God right from the throne. That she may labor at my side that I may learn what is pleasing to you. Chapter 10. Wisdom protected the first formed father of the world. Now, this is a, a reference to Adam. When he alone had been created, she delivered him from his transgression and gave him strength to rule all things. But when an unrighteous man departed from her in his anger, he perished because in rage he killed his brother. It's a reference to Cain and Abel. If you back up a little bit, the Jewish writer is crediting wisdom with the redemption of Adam. Okay? You can see how the lines, if there is a line in, in, in at least this writer's mind, between God and wisdom and his throne and like the other throne and the right, you know, all this kind of stuff, they, they tend to be blurred. They tend to be blurred. Just like, you know, in our thinking, have you ever listened to other Christians, especially when they pray? I don't mean to be critical. This is just an observation because I do it too. We mix the word God and Jesus all the time. We just, it's just a habit. It's just a reflex. You know, listen to yourself, pray, or listen to someone else, but you'll, you'll, you'll do it. You're, you're just bound to do it. We just have it fixed in our mind that they're just interchangeable. Okay, and they are. We know that they're not the same person. I like to say Jesus is but isn't God. And that, what I mean by that is he is God, but he isn't the Father. You know, there's this thing going back and forth, like how do I parse that? And, but we have this interchangeability of, of the names. And you're seeing that right here, wisdom and God. When the earth was flooded because of him, again, reference to Genesis 6, the flood, wisdom again saved it. Way to go, wisdom. When you look back in your Old Testament, you don't see wisdom in Genesis 6 through 9, do you? But again, they're thinking that it's, it's the same as saying Yahweh, so what's the big deal? Steering the righteous man by a paltry piece of wood. Another intertestamental book, Sirach, reads this way. Wisdom praises herself. That's kind of interesting. Isn't, isn't God the only entity that should be praised? Well... You know, the Shema, the Lord our God is one, and you know, all this sort of, again, Ju thinking within Judaism. Here, wisdom praises herself, tells of her glory in the midst of her people. In the assembly, 
This is a reference to the Divine Council, which I mentioned last week. And, and again, for those that that term might be unfamiliar to, it's just a reference to God surrounded by his heavenly hosts, sort of God's administration or bureaucracy that he runs the affairs of, of the cosmos with. In the assembly of the Most High, she opens her mouth, and in the presence of his hosts, she tells of her glory. That's an interesting meeting. I came forth from the mouth of the Most High. Now, wait a minute. I thought the word came forth from the mouth. Again, now, now we're seeing that blurred. And I'm telling you this deliberately. There's this blurring of wisdom, word, and even God. I came forth from the mouth of the Most High and covered the earth like a mist. I dwelt in the highest heavens, and my throne... Oh, you're going to love this. My throne was in a pillar of cloud. Where have we seen that language before? Alone I compassed the vault of heaven and traversed the depths of the abyss. Oh, over waves of the sea, over all the earth, and over every people and nation I have held sway. Before we get there, cut to the chase a little bit. I could, I could produce a lot of texts for you about wisdom more generally. Think of Proverbs. I'm going to use this as an analogy. If you read through the book of Proverbs, and you probably have many times, you may have not even thought about what you were reading in chapter 8, that all of a sudden wisdom is a person that's a co-creator right there at creation. In other words, you didn't have this, this sort of backdrop to sort of have the radar for that. You probably thought, and for really good reason, and this is accurate as well, that wisdom is about right living. It's about obeying the commandments of God. In fact, wisdom, literature, is the commandments of God. It, it, it's, it's God laying out his will. It's giving you the repository of how you are supposed to live, and, and not just in a, in a heavy-handed way, but really that if you, if you live according to this way, it's good for you. It's the best for you. God knows what's best. The Jews thought of Proverbs that way, and they thought of wisdom that way. In fact, if you really did an in-depth study of this, to the Jew, wisdom was the Torah. Wisdom was the law. They believed that the law was eternal, that it was there when God was there, that the law given to people, inscripturated, put down in writing, was the mind of God. That's why you'll hear rabbis or you'll read rabbis write that everything in the world that, that can ever be known and you need to know is in the Torah. It's in there. Now, that's quite a bit different than what the New Testament writers are going to do with it. Because the Jew takes all of that person language and embodiment language and transfers it to the Torah, the law. It used to be the case in Judaism, in Jewish theology. And we could spend a lot of time talking about this. I have a, in fact, Probably next week or the week after, we'll get into this. Judaism used to have a doctrine of two powers in heaven, two Yahwehs, visible and invisible, two gods, both Yahweh, so it wasn't polytheistic. But that's how they initially parsed some of this stuff. That changed when Christianity came along. In the second century, the two powers idea became a heresy with the birth of the, of the early church. And even before that, at when, especially after it became a heresy, Jewish thinkers and, and, and authorities went back to books like Sirach and the wisdom of Solomon and the idea that this wisdom should be equated with Torah. And they made the law just the focus of all that they were about. It was the law. The law was eternal. It was as though the law had, a, had a, an existence and a personality 
all of its own. It was an extension of Yahweh. All, those, these, all these ways we think about Jesus. So they don't want to go there <laughs> for very obvious reasons. They don't want it to be a Godhead because that's what Christianity is going to do with it. It becomes focused on the law. Now, Paul and some of the other New Testament writers, what are they constantly talking about? That righteousness doesn't come by the law. It comes by this person, Jesus. And Paul and, and, the, and the other writers are going to say, that person, that second person right there, is God. He is wisdom. He is the word. He is the angel. He's the, all, these, all these things that we associate with embodied deity in the Old Testament. So you can see that, that the conflict is just transparent. It's Christ and the law. Okay, which wisdom is it? Which word is it? Is it this person, Jesus of Nazareth, or is it the Torah? You know, Jesus says, I, I didn't come to like, do away with the Torah. I came to fulfill it. I am the embodiment of it. Okay? So it, it really casts some of the New Testament confrontations that you read about in a little bit different way. It gives, gives it a little bit more flavor. Now look at this. Here we have a synoptic passage. Luke and Matthew. I want, want to give you a minute or two to read through these and see if you can pick out the difference. I've highlighted a section in blue in each, and there's a real subtle difference between the two. Take a minute. Passages are the same context. It's pretty easy to tell that. I should step in the middle here. <laughs> I don't know where to go. <laughs> I will go. I will go astray here a little bit. What's the difference? Anybody find it? Talk about it. Tell me about it. <laughs> what do you see? Right. Who's this? Who's this? Let's let's go with Luke. The speaker is Jesus. He Jesus said, "Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear." He's getting at the law. You load people with burdens hard to bear, and yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you! For you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed, so you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, you know, that thing you think is the Torah. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will persecute and kill. You just killed the people that wisdom sent. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, if that wasn't stick your face in this enough, you get to Luke. And what does Luke do with it? Jesus is cast. He is equated with wisdom by virtue of the personal pronoun. It's no longer wisdom sending the prophets. Jesus said, I sent them. Now, if you read the synoptics together, this is a synoptic equation between wisdom and Jesus. The quotation is, I mean, the, the, everything, the, it's the same. And they both rule out the Torah, by the way, <laughs> or at least put the Torah in its proper place. Book of Hebrews. Wisdom of Solomon, you'll note, we had this verse prior. 
says, Wisdom is a reflection, apogasma, of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God, and an image of his goodness. Now the passage below is Hebrews chapter 1, the first few verses. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Very clear statement of Jesus, the agent of creation. He is the apogasma of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Apogasma in the New Testament is used one time. Right here. Now the question is, did Paul pluck that out of his working lexicon of Greek, or is he citing something? I would suggest he's citing or alluding to Wisdom of Solomon 7.26 because Wisdom of Solomon 7.26 is part of the Septuagint, and it's the only place that that word occurs. There is no other place for Paul to quote, to get it, than that passage. And again, it is, it is a, an equation pushing the Torah aside. The Torah is not the co-creator. The Torah is not, the, is not God's agent for everything. Okay. Wisdom is, but wisdom is Jesus. He is the co-creator. Again, drawing a very, to, to this audience, a very clear equation between the two. Now, I'm going to show you a couple slides, and I'm going to stop. We can talk about some of the heresies that I'll bring up, <laughs> or we can talk about some of this, but I wanted to leave plenty of time for Q&A. What I just gave you is in kernel form, if anybody asks you, where did the New Testament writers get this? It's the word and wisdom. Okay, that's their, the New Testament writers are getting their theology from the Old Testament. But they're not, and you notice, they're not accepting the interpretation or the spin that Judaism put on it. It's not the law. It's this guy. It's Jesus. Very clear divergence. But yet, the divergence comes from a shared continuity of thought. Okay, they're just taking it a different direction. But that much information has led to a number of things that you will be exposed to on TV, magazines, various either scholarship or popular culture. And I might as well just, I, I'm, I'm going to say this, how presuppositions, agendas, and imprecise thinking can turn the biblical text toward heresy. Here's the presupposition one. If you read much in archaeology, in the history of Israel, archaeology of Israel, you will come across this idea. Wisdom, sometimes in scholarly literature referred to as lady wisdom or woman wisdom, is the name of a biblical goddess. Now that's in my favorite reference work, DDD, Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible. It's just wonderful. Okay. But I disagree with that. And in the very same article, he has this. Same writer. We cannot provide much evidence for the existence of a goddess by the name of wisdom in the ancient Near East. No kidding. Okay, then why did you say that? I'll tell you why he said it, because everybody says it. It's a reflex based on the presupposition that Israel began its journey polytheistically. There just isn't really much evidence for it when it comes to this particular argument. The only, the possible, only possible evidence is the Aramaic Ahikar story, which is much later than the Old Testament. Wisdom, chokmah, is of the gods. This is a quote. Indeed, she is precious to the gods. Her kingdom is eternal. She has been established by Shemayan, which means the heavens or the heavenly one. Yes, the holy Lord has exalted her. Well, yeah, that sounds a lot like what's going on in, in Proverbs 8. You get some of the same language. But it's later than the Old Testament. I'm having a little trouble here. I don't know why. All right. Doesn't look like anything's going on. Let's go back here. 
Here's the problem that, problem that comes from agendas. Anyone know who Langdon and Sophie are? Sophie's, somebody, somebody said it. Yes, that, that is, that's absolutely correct, and that's deliberate. Because this quotation comes from a novel where the lead female character's name is Sophie because he wants you to think of Sophia or wisdom. This is from the Da Vinci Code. Robert Langdon is the male protagonist, and he's conversing with Sophie Nouveau, who is a detective. Early Jews believed that the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple housed not only God, but also his powerful female equals, Shekinah, or the Shekinah is how we usually say it, really. Well, not only would you have trouble proving that, because Shekinah is really another term for the glory. Okay, that, that's what it means. It's the glory cloud. It has nothing to do with the goddess, but Shekinah in Hebrew, the noun is grammatically feminine. So that's the only connection. And he's trying to equate it with wisdom in that book and then run with it, which he does. But if Dan Brown would have been smart enough, or if he actually had spent some time in the New Testament, he might have picked up something like this. There are New Testament texts where Jesus may be seen as the glory. The conjunction chi in Acts 7.55 may be something scholars call ex ex epexegetical. He saw the glory of God, chi, Jesus, standing at the right hand of God. You could translate that. He saw the glory of God, namely Jesus, standing at the right hand of God. That might be what Luke is intending there, equating Jesus with the glory. Another one, the idea of Jesus being seated at the right hand of the power in Mark 14, 62, Luke 22, 69, however, may be taken to, to imply that he was enthroned alongside the glory since the mystical texts use power as a synonym for glory. In Ephesians 1:17 we find the phrase, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of the glory. Now that is a literal rendering. I don't know what the ESV has, but in Greek it's ha pater, the Father, teis, that's the definite article, the word the, and then dog zeis, glory. If you just literalize that, you have Lord Jesus, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of the glory. Is that what Paul meant? Maybe. You could say the father of glory. Does that make as much sense as the father of the glory? Well, I don't know. Could be what Paul's after. This one's more familiar. Titus 2.13 may be translated the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Here Christ Jesus may be the glory of our great God and Savior. James 2.1, a notoriously difficult verse to translate, may in effect say... Our Lord Jesus Christ, the glory. Now, I know some of you have had some Greek in here. So this is holding, or having or holding the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glory. That would be literally what the Greek says. Now, what, I don't know, I think the ESV has holding, holding fast the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, period. Yeah, our Lord Jesus Christ, and then something, it does something else with the glory. You'd have to look it up. Our Lord Jesus Christ, something like that. But there's no, you know, punctuation is an issue there. and There was no punctuation or originally. So is James 2.1, is this another sort of oblique reference to Jesus being the glory? Could be. I'll tell you what it isn't. It isn't a goddess. Okay. And even if you wanted to link wisdom to it, we've just seen the New Testament writers say wisdom is Jesus. So like, what else do you want to talk about? Imprecise thinking. Aryan Christology in the verb of Proverbs 8. Remember this, I brought this up early. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. This is Proverbs 8.22. And I noted you get a real difference in translation here. Um, obviously, our Christology does not depend on the translation of one verse. But this verse became an, an item of discussion, you could imagine, in the Nicene era, okay, where the debate was, Arian Christology said that Jesus was the very highest 
of all things that God ever brought into existence higher than anything else, but he was created. In other words, the Aryan creed was there was a time when the sun was not. Okay, whereas Orthodox uh, theology, what came out of the Nicene Creed, said, no, 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 there wasn't a time when the sun was not. The sun is eternal. And Proverbs 8 became a focus of this because it's like, well, look, if Jesus is wisdom, here you have this verb. In Hebrew, it's kana. I just want to see if this will open here. Hebrew is kana, and it actually does have a very wide range of usages. My software here. There is, notice number one and number two, this lexicon believes that there are two kanas, they're homonyms. Hebrew has homonyms just like English does, just like any other language does. And you'll notice some of the options. Kana can mean acquire. It's used of acquiring a field. Kana, a field. It's used of buying, purchasing. Okay. Buy as a wife. God redeemed. Okay, it can be used for that. Again, there's, there's, a, there's an exchange there. Down here with this kana, it can mean create. Genesis 14, uh, God is called the Mo El Elyon is called the the kana er, <laughs> the kana, the creator of heaven and earth. So it means create there, and a few other passages. And Eve says says I have kanad, a man with the help of the Lord. So it produced, given birth to. You know, loosely created, okay, obviously. It's new life. So this became a real focus of debate. And I like to think of it this way. All of those are, are uh, legitimate translations, but you have to translate in context. And what's the overall context? With wisdom, you see the ESV has possessed. That comes from the acquired idea. I don't really like that one because it implies that there was a time when God like, didn't have wisdom and he had, to, he had to either possess it or keep it in, like it was kind of escape. Brought forth is kind of nice language. God had wisdom and he brought it forth when he needed it to use it, the agent of his creation. What, you really, what, what they really came down to was the difference between being born and being begotten. Now, in our, in our parlance, we don't really distinguish that. But the language of the day they did, I, I like to say it this way, is wisdom eternal or not? Okay, wisdom is, is an, at, you look at Proverbs, it's an attribute of God that gets personified, as we've just seen tonight in Proverbs 8 and elsewhere. So I think the question should be as to which is the right translation should take this into context. Was there ever a time when God lacked wisdom? And if there was, then my next question is, how was he still God? In other words, you have a God who doesn't have wisdom at some point. That doesn't make much logical or theological sense. And that was the view, that was really the question, the issue that won the day at Nicaea because we can't have God not having wisdom. Wisdom has to be eternal because God's eternal. How can it be an attribute of God and it is an eternal? Because if he didn't have it, then he wouldn't be God. It doesn't make any sense. And so Athanasius championed that explanation. And so that he, he became in history the articulator of what we have as Orthodox Christology now. And you have to match that against a whole lot of other verses that do talk about Jesus being an eternal being, okay? the, all these Godhead verses and whatnot. So the context is, is full and it's there. It's not contrived.